It's 10 o'clock. You're listening to BBC Radio Scotland with me, Connie McLaughlin, coming up on the programme. Now, at a time where you think maybe, maybe I might be starting to wind down a little bit. Well, think again, because we'll find out why more over 50s are taking on a second job. And what is it really like to become a parent of twins? Plus, just keep swimming, just keep swimming, just keep swimming, swimming, swimming. <laughs> it's Scotland's five seconds of summer. Well, I'm hoping it's a little bit more than five seconds, but we'll, we'll, we'll just see how that pans out. We're going to be hearing about the best spots for an alfresco duke. And an award-winning pet expert, Ross Allen, is here. So if you've got any cat queries or dog dilemmas, get them in now. You can text 80295 or you can give us a call 0805 92 95 00. All the conversations that matter. Mornings with Kay Adams on BBC Radio Scotland. Kay's back with you next week. It's Connie with you until midday today. And Alfresco Duke, that sounds quite nice, doesn't it? I hope it's nice and warm where you are. Um, it is uh, Tuesday today, which means it is time for Name the Place or Quiz here in BBC Radio Scotland. If you have, if you've never heard it before, first of all, where have you been? Right. But if you know how it goes, um, then get yourself at the ready, right? But I'm just going to go over the sort of basics of it in case this is your first time. So Carol Huff provides a list of excellent, mind-boggling, I think is the best way to describe them, clues that should lead you to a place in Scotland. And when you think you've got the answer, you can text me, right, on 80295. And when we've got a right answer, you're going to hear this noise. (coughs) Right, that's the sound to listen out for. So um, are you ready to play? If so... Here we go. This is clue number one today. Today's place name refers to a little known saint. Today's place name refers to a little known saint. 80295. Uh, keep your thoughts coming in to me. We'll kick this morning off with some music. This is a Fine Young Cannibals and she drives me crazy.
Fine Young Cannibals she drags me crazy it's ten past ten here in BBC Radio Scotland I hope you're well um, now for many people their 50s could be a time to start winding things down a little bit looking towards retirement um, and maybe I don't know hanging about <laughs> right now they should be in their back gardens enjoying the sunshine but um Thinking for others, it could be a time when things are just getting started. So over the past 10 years, the number of over 50s with a second job has increased by over 100,000, according to the latest research from the over 50s uh, organisation Rest Less. Uh, so what is driving the change? That's a question that we're asking this morning. Why are people taking on uh, other jobs. Um, here to chat to me more about this is uh, Stuart Lewis from the uh, Chief Executive of Rest Less. Morning, Stuart. Good morning. And uh, expert recruitment expert, Shan Saba. Morning, Shan. Good morning. And uh, Helen Robertson, who uh, comes by being a hairdresser and is also the author of Ur Haggis. Morning, Helen. Good morning. Right, sure. Tell me, what are we seeing uh, in terms of this change for the over 50s? There's two main driving forces that are almost um, polar opposites, if that makes sense. So for fortunate, affluent uh, professionals, um, midlife is a time of great opportunity, actually, and many are using it as an opportunity to move into a portfolio career, perhaps as advisors, as non-execs, uh, a little bit of fractional leadership in there, and to, to really benefit and broaden out their skill set. I think the important thing to reflect is that for those less fortunate, that like, Amongst the cost of living pressures, we're also seeing people have to take on second jobs in order to make ends meet. And actually, because of a lack of flexible work in uh, secure employment, they're having to take a number of different shift patterns to fit around life and caring responsibilities, perhaps for elderly relatives. Yeah, that can be part of it as well, I guess, Shan. Oh, Shan, are you still there? Oh, yes, sorry. Hiya, how are you doing? Sorry about that. <laughs> yeah, no, that's OK. I'm just saying that that can be part of it as well. There's, I guess there's lots of different reasons and factors behind these stats. There's so many, so many reasons, and you're absolutely right. You know, um, this, when I read the article, it was so interesting, but it does, it, we've seen this in a workplace setting that people are they're, they're either having to return to work, sadly. You know, they've used the pandemic, as we all know, sped up. Many people saying, I've just had enough. I'm not doing this anymore. And they jacked their jobs. But now they've had to look at coming back because they just can't afford it. Another side, as your previous caller just said there, is that we've seen them maybe looking at a, a second job because it's something to keep them going or they're doing something different and they're spreading themselves. But the one thing that we've learned over the last few years with the shortages in the labour market, the levels of unemployment and that type of thing, is that the value of somebody who's over 50 because they've actually got a lot more to offer the workplace um, than would have previously been thought about. Now, the Age Discrimination Act has been in place for a long, long time, but we know unconscious bias exists in many, many of us and many, many employers. And But what we've seen is when these over 50s have been returning to work, they're offering a lot more to the workplace. They're wiser, they're more flexible, they're open-minded, and it's actually, they've shown what a worthwhile addition they are to the workforce. Helen, what's your experience? Because you're pretty much multitasking right now, aren't you? <laughs> Hairdresser, yeah, author, I, goodness me. Yeah, I wear many hats. Well, the author bit was a bit accidental. Again, that was due to, to lockdown. Um, I wrote and illustrated a book during lockdown, ended up making some merchandise to go with it, and um, as well as, uh, well, well, I couldn't do my hairdressing job while, while we were in lockdown, so you have got to keep yourself busy uh, in some way, but I, I think um, us over 50s, we're used to being kept busy. Um, but we think after speaking to you yesterday, there's a lot more people in their 50s single nowadays as well. So part of it is the social aspect of meeting more people, interacting with people um, that maybe was now, uh, you, you didn't have the same numbers being single 10, 20 years ago in, in our age bracket. Um, but, yeah, we've got a lot more skills to offer. Um, probably a bit more patience and more reliable than, a lot of, sadly to say, some of the younger ones as well. Um, we'll still get up when we're not feeling well and get get to work. Do you feel as if there's almost like a... this The expectation is changing, this idea of, you know, we're working towards getting to retirement, whereas in actual fact a lot of people are like, well... I, I don't really want to retire because I, I, I love my job or I enjoy it for all the reasons that you just mentioned there, the social aspect of it and the structure that it gives to your life and, and everything else that comes around 
not you know money it, working not just for a, for a financial benefit but also for the, for for everything else. Yeah, I mean, there is there's all those factors in it, and and I think as well, where it's almost like going through another uh, middle age crisis as well. It's like I've got. I've got all these skills, but what have I not tried? What have I not done? Let's see if I can add another string to my bow and, and fit more in. It's almost like a, a bucket list of jobs, if, for what yeah. another way of putting it. You know, let's try try something new. You know, I, I've still got life in me yet. What was, it, what was the part of you that decided, right, OK, that writing this book and, and, and the illustration of this book was something that you wanted to do is that is that is it something that you thought about for a long time doing and, and, and lockdown gave you the time or was it just something that popped into your mind because you were not doing much else yeah well i mean i've been telling stories about haggis for years and um i've got five grandkids and i used to um, make do what they called mash-up stories you know do fairy tales but add their names in and their wants and likes and things like that you know like goldilocks and the three bears and then i would name three of my grandkids and uh, and things like that so and i believe everybody's got a book in them so lockdown gave me lots of time to think and reflect and things like that and i decided right let's um let's get these stories down and I did a few more and a few more, did the illustrations, and I'm like, right, how am I going to publish this? So I did it through Amazon. So, you know, and I've learned more skills along the way. And then it's turned into an accidental business because I had to make a furry one to go with the book. <laughs> and then I got asked for, can you do this? Can you do that? Oh, and, yeah. you know, and it's just it's just spiralled from there. But I, I think during lockdown, a lot of people have reflected and you're like, you know, how do I fill my time? Right, you know, I've always wanted to do this, I've always wanted to do that. And a lot more of the, the handmade and craft made things have come to the forefront as well. Um, people, you know, doing many businesses on the side, that some of them have actually grown quite massive. Has it changed how you felt about yourself, the success of, of, of your side hustle, I feel like? Well, I think in a way... I've, it's this self belief belief and self sabotage, you know, oh I, I couldn't do this, I couldn't do that, or oh I don't want to get it, it, it to go too big and things like that. But I've been on a, a what you call an elevator programme with business gateway and they've made me look at um my business differently, my side hustle differently, um, that it could be my main business. Um it's made me b- believe more in myself, be more focused and things like that. And I mean business practices have changed so much, um, I would say in the last fifty years and fifty odd years since I've been on the planet, um, that you know, it does help, you know, get extra help and support that takes something from a side hustle um, and it's something beautifully big. Stuart, it, it, it's interesting hearing Helen, who's almost sort of, I guess, taking responsibility and control of, of what she's doing. If people are not in that situation, and, and, and you kind of hinted at it a little bit earlier about maybe for different reasons they need things to be slightly more flexible for them, for different sort of, you know, family situations. What what are we seeing in that respect? Yeah, so so we are encouraged that more and more progressive employers are waking up to the opportunities of flexible working and actually trying to build propositions that work for employees of all ages, actually, and employment propositions that do so. But, but like any form of social change, it's too slow. So not enough for really embracing uh, flexible working and embracing policies and procedures to support um, women through menopause and, and to support people through caring for elderly relatives. I always, I always kind of point out how much workplace energy goes into support around maternity and paternity policies, and rightly so, because because we need them. But if, if there's only a fraction of the time and support put into, actually, how do I help people at this stage of life, given one-third of the UK's workforce are now over the age of 50, when when are more and more employers going to wake up to the, the enormous opportunity that brings, but also the kind of social obligation to, to, to make their, make workforce work for people of all ages. Shan, what are you seeing in terms of numbers of, of people over 50 coming to you? Statistically, I can't quote uh, exactly, but we have seen a spike. Particularly, COVID showed this because 
when people were furloughed initially, when they were furloughed from their, the jobs that they actually did, we saw a number, a significant number over 50s coming in to do jobs that they wouldn't traditionally do, if that makes sense. And then the following couple of years when we saw the labour shortages, we just saw them uh, accepting, sorry, we saw employers accepting they had to be much more flexible, just like was mentioned there. So they had to change their proposition and accept that they needed people to, um, you know, different shift patterns, changing from traditional models of working. And that really saw a, a spike. But it's, it's the employer mentality now. And as you say, social change is taking a bit longer than it should. We have seen those shoots of people accepting, employers accepting. We need to have people, doesn't matter what age they are, let's just get them in and let's treat them properly with dignity and respect and the working patterns that they want. And that's what we've seen the start of, particularly over the last few years. Well, what sort of industries is, is that happening in more more than but, more than others? Uh, it's the hard hit ones, let's be honest. You know, the ones where the necessity has borne this, isn't it? Because where there's been shortages, so for example, in food manufacturing, hospitality, retail, those that were hit post-pandemic, post-Brexit, you know, we've had a significant number of our workforce leave um, to go back to Europe and post-Brexit. So we have now, employers have had to look, the business community have had to look, how do we backfill those roles? But actually, they've had to change those propositions to make them more acceptable. So it tends to be where there's been hard to, and also in the care sector as well. I was really interested to what you were saying earlier on about the sort of change in attitude to, towards employees who are slightly older and and I mean realistically and, and I don't know if I'm just saying this because I've just turned into my 40s but I feel as if in your 50s is not in any way you know old but we're talking about the older workforce um, whenever you are, are seeing people who are coming into that age bracket what, what change are we seeing in in this sort of mentality and, and, and how people treat them I, th I think when you're I think the difference probably is that when you look at that workforce, well, like, I'll give you an example, and this is a historic example, but I think it's one that always rings in my head. I don't know if you recall a number of years ago, I'm going back ages ago, B&Q changed their recruitment policy. And I don't know what they called it, but they would have, like, for example, a retired plumber would be working in the aisles and the plumbing aisles. So if you ever went to get, you're doing some, doing some DIY, you're actually talking to an ex-trade person, but they tended to be older because they'd step back from being you know, hands-on. And they were open, they were flexible, they knew exactly what they were talking about, they were just wiser. And that's where I'd probably get, get give, give you this point from. Those, I'm not too far away from the age of 50 myself, and I think I'd like to think I'm a lot more wiser than I was when I was 22, 25, whatever it was. But I also don't have a much of an ego anymore, if that makes sense. I'm not out there to prove anything. I'm yeah. out to do my job, help people around me, just get what I need to done and do it and and that's really really important because you need a good balance in the workforce Helen what would you say to someone maybe who's sitting listening and they're like mm, I, I, I'm, I'm listening to, to Helen that sounds quite inspiring I, I, I quite fancy doing something whether it's writing a book or, or or something else that they are you know passionate about what would you say to them go for it absolutely go for it there's loads of help and support out there don't resist it ask plenty of questions um, you know, just just go for it. What have you got to lose? You know, um, just just go for it. Um, anybody can do what I'm doing. Maybe not just quite the same as me, but everybody can do whatever they want to do in their own unique way. But just get the help and support. Um, there's loads of people out there that will help. Uh, yeah, um, you, you, attend, you, you, attend you don't want to... fairs, whatever. You know, just. Just get the help and support that's there. I was just going to say, you don't want to um, flood the Ur Haggis market out there. <laughs> Listen, Helen, thanks so much for sharing your story this morning. More than welcome. And good luck to anybody that's um, going to start on a new journey. It's never too, You're never too old. You're never too young. Just go for it. Uh, good advice there. That's Helen Robertson, who's a hairdresser and author of Ur Haggis. That was uh, Stuart Lewis as well, who's Chief Executive of Restless, and Shan Saba, who is a recruitment expert. It is 10.24. You're through to the final of the Scottish Cup. How's that feel? Oh, it's a huge honour. Scottish football's oldest prize is at stake. Celtic take on Inverness Caledonian Thistle. Celtic are chasing a historic treble. They will be massive favourites. We haven't done it yet. We've given ourselves an opportunity to do something special. But Inverness, Caledonian and Thistle have their sights set on lifting the trophy for a second time. We'll not just be turning up and just being underdogs. We'll be hoping to make a game of it. The Scottish Cup final on Saturday with Bill
build up across the D and the live action from 5.30. And that's surely the goal that seals the deal. Watch on BBC One Scotland. Listen on Radio Scotland. Still to come, our Ask the Vet Surgery is open. Uh, our pet expert, Ross Allen, is here to answer all your questions so you can get them in. You can text me 80295 or you can give Ross a call 08085 92 95 00. Uh, plus... You and I are like... Like sisters. <laughs> sisters. We're like twins. Oh, we'll be finding out the reality of being the parents of twins, being the new parent of one. I cannot even imagine what that's like. We're going to be we're going to be hearing exactly the reality of it uh, a little bit later in the programme. Uh, you can give me a text, 80295, or you can give me a call, 08085 92 95 double. We'll get your thoughts in for Ross Allen. Got something to say? Text 80295. Standard message rates apply. Mornings on BBC Radio Scotland. I'm going to be giving you well for name the place shortly. I've got a couple of wrong answers. I will uh, give you details of them after this from Emily Sandy. It's next to me. Emily Sandy and next to me. It's just coming up to half past ten here on BBC Radio Scotland. Uh, now, if you were listening to the phone in between nine and ten, we were talking about mental resilience and emotional well-being and whether or not that should be part of the school's curriculum in this country. Um, 
loads of you got in touch with us between 9 and 10. I really appreciate you getting in touch with us. I just wanted to go through some of the rest of the text messages that I didn't get a chance to earlier. Um, we had this from Stuart. Parents uh, should step up to the mark and take more responsibility for their children or go on a parenting course financed by themselves, depending on their income. So this idea of who really should this be falling to? Should it be happening in terms of this information being passed on at schools or should this be at home? Uh, this text, and it's, there's no name on it, but it says, I, I agree with the man who said get a grip and highlighted that the main responsibility for mental health uh, with the child lies with the parents and perhaps additional services. I was a head teacher for many years. Yet again, we hear that this responsibility is passed to teachers and schools. We can do our bit, but the uh, most part of it, it needs to come uh, from the parents at home. If you were uh, to look back on your phone in over the years, you'll find that so-called experts called for schools and uh, to shoulder responsibility for de- dealing with almost every social problem. How on earth can schools ram yet another subject into the curriculum? Thank you so much for everyone. Um, quite an emotive conversation that this morning, but a really important one as well, I think. Um, I said to you earlier, I would give you the second name, the place quiz uh, question. I am good to my word. Clue number two. Are you ready? Here it comes. Uh, clue number two uh, is it also contains a little known word for a church. Right. It also contains a little known word for a church. So clue one, today's place name refers to a little known saint. Clue number two, it also refers to a little known word for for a church, a couple of wrong answers. Um, oh, uh, Abbey St. Bathans, Gordon and Pentecade. Uh, Tane says John and Paisley and Alison from Kilmarnock. Johnson says John in Kilmarnock. No. Egg says Stephen in Grangemouth or St. Cyrus, Sonia in Dundee. These are all wrong answers. Keep your thoughts though coming in. 80295, does that make it any easier for you? With clue number two, you can let me know. Uh, right, it is um, eight, uh, 10.31. It's time for uh, our Ask the Vet part of the programme. Uh, our resident vet, Ross Allen from Pets and Vets in Glasgow, is here. Morning, Ross. Good morning, Connie. We'll have our full surgery after 11 o'clock. Uh, but I just wanted to check in with you um, because there's lots to talk about, especially when I look out the window and it is roasting hot outside. Um, and it gets to that time of the year where we have to talk about the safety, I guess, of our pets. Well, it's definitely something that comes up. I mean, it's roasty toasty in Glasgow, certainly today. And, uh, you know, on my way to work today, I saw a lot of dogs that were were panting as they were walking along the side of the road. And and definitely this is something that makes me think about temperature and the impact it can have on pets. So it is a a good discussion to have for sure. Okay, what do we do? What are the things that we can do to make sure our our pets are safe? And also, I suppose, even even before that, the sort of signs that we should be looking for to make sure that that, that we know that our, our dogs or cats need some help. Right, so the first thing to bear in mind is that dogs and cats are fundamentally different to us, all right? So in terms of people and their temperature, the main way we control our temperature is, and it's not very nice to talk about it, but it's sweating, isn't it? That's what we do to control our temperature. But dogs and cats are different. They don't really sweat in the same way. They mainly sweat through their pads, and you know, they're in contact with the ground, but they're not using sweat to control their temperature. The way they're controlling their temperature is to pant, all right? And that's obviously to help them breathe in cool air and breathe out the warm air, and that helps them thermoregulate or control their temperature. And the problem is that there are certain groups of pets, both dogs and cats, that maybe have trouble panting or aren't as effective or as efficient about panting. And that's mainly the flat-faced breeds because they've not got as much kind of surface area in their airways in contact with the cooler air. And also older dogs and cats, they're also not as efficient at panting and that can mean that they are prone to having problems controlling their temperature, especially in this warmer weather. Um, what about the animals that are not dogs and cats? Because we automatically assume, you know, m- m- many people, if we're talking about pets, that's what they would have. But what about the other types of animals that people might have? I think r- rabbits as well are, they tend to be quite passive in terms of temperature. So like, as long as they've not got, um, you know, they're not in direct heat, as long as they're able to get into the shade, that then they'll be able to cool down and they'll tend not to over-exercise. They'll tend to take it easy. In terms of, I guess, you know, pet birds, they'll also, you know, generally be in the shade you shouldn't have them in direct sunlight because you know there's little doubt that um you know maybe it's reverting back to dogs but in dogs in a car you know that's the 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 horror story that we hear about and unfortunately does still happen even though folk you know know that it is a big danger you know the temperature in these enclosed environments can really rise up really quickly so for dogs and cars for example and the temperature that we've got in glasgow today they could in 10 minutes go from about 22 degrees up to 47 degrees if they were shut in the car yeah so Whatever your type of pet, I think the main thing is to make sure that there's going to be a movement of air around them, make sure they've got access to shade and certainly don't over-exercise them in the, the warmest part of the day. 
Right, that seems sensible. Okay, um, any questions that you've got at all for Ross? No um, animal too big or too small. I say that now, I'm just putting you in at Ross. Uh, Ross is going to be back after 11 o'clock this morning. So you get your thoughts, uh, get your questions at 80295 or you can give him a call 08085 9295 at double O. Before that, though, um, it's 10.35. Uh, many people uh, who might have grown up with more than one child, a brother or a sister, having two at the same time might be quite a different experience. And uh, reality TV star Danny Dyer has revealed that she's given birth to two uh, daughters, twins. So uh, as she and her partner, the footballer Jared Bowen, adjust to the new arrivals, what can they expect as parents of twins? It got us speaking this morning and we thought it'd be a really interesting conversation to have. Uh, Moira McCormack is a life enhancement coach and mum of twins. Morning, Moira. Good morning. Uh, I've always... I have more than twins. I've got four. I had two more after the twins. Goodness gracious me. That's that's a lot to be getting on with. Mm-hmm. <laughs> we'll, we'll get into that in just a second. I also, I also want to introduce Kat Storer, who's a journalist and also mum of twins. Uh, morning, Kat. Good morning. Yes, I also have one more. I had one and then twins, so I've right. had three. <laughs> three, goodness me. Right, I'm losing count here. Uh, we've also got parenting expert uh, on hand, Sue Atkins. Morning, Sue. Good morning. Right. There is a lot going on here. And as I was saying earlier on, as as a new mum of a four month old um, who's just managing to get some mascara on after four months, <laughs> I don't know how you could even I, I, honestly, Moira, I've no idea how you do it with 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 more than one. I don't, how many? It's just like, where do you put them? Uh, well, I had the twins and then two and a half years later, I had a third child. And she used to cry and say, I want to be a twiblet, because she too wanted to be a twin because she recognised it was special. Um, And then I had six years and I had my fourth. So it it, it was a lot. I think what it taught me more than anything was surrender. I couldn't imagine that I could do another life. The life was looking after my children. It it was massively intense to have three under three. I can imagine. Massively intense to have, you know, two under... When people talk about just, you know, different age groups. But when you've got two who have got the same needs at the same time, how do you manage that? Because I'm imagining, you know, you get one to sleep and you think, right, OK, I'm winning at life here. I can get a little bit of time to stick some washing on or do a bit of cleaning up or whatever else. Then another one cries, wakes the other one up. I, I, I don't know how you manage that. Well, that... I mean, that is... That, that, that side of the labour is... True and very real. And I breastfed both my twins for a year, so I fed them myself, which was another huge labour of love. Um, And I had to just give up almost everything else, let everything else go. But the real labour is the emotional labour. Because if you have one baby, like when we had a singleton after having twins... I would hold the baby, and then my husband would hold the baby, and we'd both start laughing. We were a little bit hysterical, and I'd go, I haven't got a baby. <laughs> and he'd go, I haven't got a baby, and we'd pass the, the single term back and forth, and we just thought it was hysterical, because before, we had always had a baby. Um, but the, the real work is that if you have one baby, you hold your baby, and you have, and you develop one relationship, yours and the baby's. When you have twins, from the get-go, you're having two relationships, one with each baby, and you're also negotiating their relationship. So you're having three relationships that you're negotiating from the minute they are born. And that's where the work is. You haven't got, oh, you can go to bed half an hour later because you're a little bit older. You've got none of that. You've got two children who are on this competitive edge straight away Um, and that's why they say things like good twin bad twin because they adopt a position that the other doesn't have in order to try and differentiate themselves Kat that idea of surrender does that sound familiar Uh, yeah I think I am I had my singleton first so um, I kind of knew once the twins came along I realised how easy I'd had it the first time, obviously not knowing that the first time. Um, And actually I found the twins the second time round, I found that a really lonely time because um, with my singleton I could go out and I could feed him wherever I needed to and I could 
um, hand him to friends if I wanted to run to the toilet. But then that all completely changes when you've got, you know, two babies who want to be fed simultaneously. You've got a massive buggy that you can't get into anywhere. You certainly can't take carry two babies into a toilet. All that kind of stuff became so much more difficult. So I ended up just staying at home quite a lot because I was feeding them myself as well. So it was just... I just felt like I just made all my friends come to me. I asked for as much help as I possibly could get, which I think is the key thing, is do not be afraid to ask for help because you have a genuine need for it, for your own sanity, your own, you know, self-preservation. You know, you need somebody, family, whoever you can, to come and help you hold a baby while you feed yourself or should wash yourself, um, which became, you know, the second time around, it, it became so clear that, that um yeah double babies equals double double stress um but you know there's lots of ways of helping but you know there's lots of kit out there that that can kind of help you i my babies spent quite a lot of time in bouncers so as soon as one got fed the other one it went into a bouncer and then i fed the other one and then um you know there's there's so much stuff out there that can can help you there's, there's you know there's so many more twins being born these days um so at least there's, there's things that can can assist in these ways but it was yeah it the first year is for me is is still a a blur my twins are four now and um it was it was a roller coaster Um, what what are the silly things that people say to you Kat as as a as a mum of twins because I've got a friend who's got twins and people would say to her oh well it's good at least you get them both away at the same time and these sort of and, and I even know that as, as like a, a new mum now when people say things and they think they're being funny or they think they're being like um, helpful and you're thinking yeah. don't say that to me <laughs> On a bad day, the twin kind of attraction that you get just walking on the street can really be quite hard to cope with. I get anything from oh, the, the classic double trouble, you've got your hands full, which is obviously just stating the obvious and not helpful in any way. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, people calling you a, a super mum or superhero, which they think is nice, but actually at the same time, you know, you're really feeling like a a duck kind of paddling manically underwater, just barely keeping your head above water a lot of the time. Um, and then I always, I have found, especially because I'd had the single turn first, the intrusive comments were kind of, the people just felt like they were able to ask me whether they were IVF or conceived naturally or oh. um, how, how they were born, whether it was a, a vaginal delivery or a C-section. I think, you know, I'm sitting in a cafe here don't know you i don't really feel like you need to be asking me these questions while i'm having my much needed coffee this morning thank you very much and i never got asked those questions with one baby but people just seem to think with twins that that's a license to kind of ask even and i understand because they are perhaps a novelty but to me i just found that very intrusive and, and not really um acceptable in my in my opinion so that just listening to what Moira and Kat are saying, that's it's it's a lot, I, and I, I was interested just to hear that the the word that Moira used was labour. You know, we talk about that as how you get these babies here, but actually the labour doesn't stop after that point. Um, it, it, how do you how do parents manage that? And 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 again, that idea of the relationship and and managing those different relationships, I thought was interesting as well. I thought it was absolutely fascinating listening to it, um, you know, hands on, um, because I think one of the key things that came out of the conversation there and what I suggest to parents as well is seek support and focus on self-care. You know, it's not selfish, it's self-care. And and lots of mums, you know, are so busy when they've got to and also if one is poorly or one is premature or they're both premature rather then it becomes really really important that you do seek support get some help don't try and be what you know this idea of super mother which is ridiculous and it is about really then making sure that you are thinking about providing you know like you said um one-on-one at times as well as nurturing both and remembering then to keep all the plates spinning with your partner. So it's quite a lot going on, isn't there? Lots of juggling. What about the actual relationships themselves between the children as they grow? Because Kat was saying that her, her kids are four now. Um, how does that differ from, from singletons? 
I remember when I was deputy head and class teacher for a number of years, 20 years, um, there were twins in one of the classes. And one of the key things that we talked about is making sure each child felt individual. That I wouldn't like to be lumped together as, oh, which one are you? Have you got a red ribbon in today or a yellow ribbon so I can tell the difference? I mean, that's so rude, really. So the children have their own unique bond and you nurture that and encourage it, but also creating that individual time. And as they grow, change and become their own person with their own personality, and characters, encouraging and nurturing that between them. And also with you, you know, keeping that connection going and encouraging each child to be, you know, who they want to be and who they are. Moira, how do you do that without, you know, what Sue's saying there, brandishing, oh, there's the twins, or that they become this entity rather than two separate people? I tried not to call them the twins. I tried to call Mm. them by their names because mine Mm. aren't um, identical twins. Most twins are dizygotic fraternal twins, so they are uh, genetically siblings, but they've grown in the tummy at the same time, and they you raise them in the same way. Um, so they are siblings, and um, keeping them with their own individual identity was absolutely key for me. They had colours. Um, one was purple, one was pink, because they were two girls. I think if you have a girl and a boy, you have a sort of a gender differentiation. But two girls, you you know, and two girls that, that, although they were fraternal, also still looked quite alike, really working to encourage each of them in their own gifts. It, it Mm. It was an amazing thing to do. I mean, I loved every minute of it. I was tired with it. But my goodness me, I loved raising those girls so much. I had so much fun with them. Um, And at times we would just have to crash on the sofa and read books and books and books and do gentle things together. But it it was really good fun as well. I mean, that shouldn't be lost inside everything else, that they are very funny, the things they come out with. And... um, Yeah, I just tried to encourage all my children to um, be the best who they were, to to be themselves as much as possible. Kat, what about you? It's the final point from you. Uh, Yes, mine are also non-identical, and actually they are very different, which does make it easy as far as they have their different interests, which help them pursue separately and individually. Um, Actually, one of them is much more similar to their older brother in looks and in sort of interests, hobbies. So it's actually been more tricky trying to kind of not leave the third third brother out. Yes, Um, yeah. But obviously it's quite nice because the twins do have their very special bonds. They've been at preschool and nursery together um, the whole time. They're starting school in September and we will be um, separating them into different classes just so that they can really pursue different friendships and interests and, and not be compared because even though they are, you know, we just say their brothers are born on the same day, basically. Um, they they are very different and then we're very conscious of not kind of saying, well, you're all, because we've got three boys, you know, you're not all doing football at the same time. We're not all doing this because that's not, you know, they, it's just, they, they've got completely different personalities um, and it's beautiful, it's lovely because, it, it, you know, they obviously scrap and and fight a little bit but actually seeing them together is is wonderful and again we have a lot of fun there's so much energy in this house um we just you know fun in games and and it's really special i I feel very proud of them um and proud of myself for sort of getting to there anymore but i feel like it's been a it's been a a lot so far um but i'm hoping it will get easier as we go on uh, fascinating insight. Thank you so much to, to, to all of you for your, your contribution. That was Maura Cormac, life and enhancement coach, mum of twins. Uh, Kat Storr is a journalist and mum of twins, both actually Maura and Kat having other kids as well. And uh, that was Sue Atkins there, who's a parenting expert. Fascinating listening to that. Um, just in, I guess, the trials and tribulations, how, how difficult it can be at times, but also just how... Uh, how brilliant it is uh, having that experience. Right, it is 10.48. Let's get some more music. We're going to be talking about outdoor pools shortly, but this is...
evenings on BBC Radio Scotland. Friday night is Vinyl Night. A place for the greatest and latest music on a Friday. And a first play here on Interest in Scotland. Of course we're going to play it. The best in traditional music on a Saturday. Ladies and gentlemen, please take the floor. So sit back as we listen to some of the finest players and bands from the world of piping. And the perfect music to round off the weekend on a Sunday. Concert performances and recordings by Scotland's best classical musicians. End the day in the company of songwriting masters of country, folk, blues, soul and rock and roll. The place to be this weekend. Be dead like this. BBC Radio Scotland. Coming up on mornings after 11 o'clock, Ross Allen is here. Our uh, Ask the Vet surgery will be open. Um, any questions that you've got for your furry friends, maybe you've got a dog, cat, whatever it is, uh, there's still time to get in touch with all your pet-related queries. You can give them a call 0885 92 95 00 or you can send uh, Ross a text 80295 is the best way to do that. And... Good morning. Good morning. Morning person, are you? I definitely think I'm more of a morning person than I was when I was younger, if that makes sense. I do love, there's a sort of element of smugness, isn't there, about getting up first thing and feeling as if you're up before many other people until it gets to the afternoon and then you're shattered. But like, can you can you train yourself to become a morning person? That's a question I'm going to be asking just after 11 o'clock. Get in touch with BBC Radio Scotland. You can call our free phone number on 08085 9295 Text 80295. Standard message rates apply. This is BBC Radio Scotland. Right, it's Tuesday, which means name the place. I've given you the first two clues of the quiz so far. Clue number one, today's place name refers to a little-known saint. Clue number two, it also contains a little-known word for a church. Clue number three, the only church dedicated to the same saint was at Kincardine and Menteith in Stirling. Does that make things any clearer for you? 80295, if you want to play Name the Place today, get in touch. I'll read out some of the wrong answers uh, before 11 o'clock as well. Um, now, but we've been talking about the weather and how beautiful it is outside right now. It's, hopefully it is where you are, because I know some parts of the country that might not be the case. Um, but Guruk Outdoor Swimming Pool has recently been hitting the headlines when it featured on the cover of the new Blur album. And with the uh, warm weather set to continue for this week anyway, it'll no doubt be proving pretty popular. But we thought, we'd have a look and see where else people can cool off. Um, so here to chat about this is Robin McKelvey, who's a Scottish travel writer and broadcaster. Morning, Robin. Good morning, Connie. We've also got Councillor Francesca Brennan, who's the Vice Convener of Education and Committees in Inverclyde. Morning, Francesca. Hi there. Thanks so much for having me on. Hi. Uh, you're, you're welcome. We've got Steve Harris, who's the Chair of the uh, Friends of Stonehaven Open Air Pool. Morning, Steve. Good morning. Right, uh, Robin, let me start with you. Open air pools right now, um, especially today and over the last couple of days, will be busier than normal, surely? Absolutely. I mean, we're sort of renowned for a dreary climate, but on a day like today, you want to get in the water, you want to cool off. So they're absolutely perfect time to be going for an outdoor pool. Right. What are these facilities like? Give us a little bit of a kind of overview if, if no one's been down to see some of them before. It does vary. I draw a distinction between your classic sort of Leroes, um, that's your Stonehaven, your Guruks. They've got facilities changing and some really cool modern extras like sort of gyms and slides and things. Then there are your bit more rough and ready sort of tidal pools. You find those in East Newk and North Berwick and up in Wick. So careful which one you choose. I would go for Guruk and Stonehaven if you want all singing, all dancing or somewhere else if you want a bit more rough and ready. Oh, good job that we've got Francesca and Steve here. I think they might agree. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Francesca, you uh, congratulations first of all um, the, the cover of the new Blood album. How does that feel? That must have been pretty, pretty cool. Oh, it was so exciting, you know, it was just popping up on social media about a week ago, the ballad of Darren, and loads of people talking about it, loads of Blur fans in the area as they're at around the world, and it was just great to see that image of our iconic Gurdick pool right there on it, you know, just shining through, it was, it was brilliant, I mean, we are, we are huge fans of the Gurdick pool here in Inverclyde anyway, and I'm a regular swimmer there myself, but... It's just brilliant to have it advertised to the world and get loads more people coming in to see all the great things that we've got to offer. We'd, we'd love to take the credit for, <laughs> you know, <laughs> for getting that album cover out there. But I think it just was a bit of good fortune on our part. You know, it's a it's a well-known image and, you know, Good at Pool features regularly on the front pages of local newspapers, you know, and features on the BBC. But 
um, it's it's not one that's probably had that sort of worldwide attention, and and definitely you're talking about the good weather. It's a bit of a grey sky on that on that image, but here in Inverclyde today it's lovely weather, and the good it's brilliant and that sort of weather. But even in the rain as well, or something just really special about that sort of outdoor feel, but with all the modernised facilities that we've got there as well. Yeah, yeah, in, yeah. In, the, in the middle of, in the middle of nature certainly. Um, so so that's Guruk. Um, Steve, what yeah. about uh, what's happening in, in Stonehaven? Tell us about the pool there. Uh, well, the, the pool in, in Stonehaven is a is a classic. Uh, it's an absolutely beautiful weather here today too, by the way. Um, and uh, opened in um, 1934. There was a poll of the local residents in 1933. And a year later, we opened uh, the pool. And so next year will be its 90th anniversary. We're very lucky. We've just had a huge investment from the local authority, Aberdeenshire Council, in it, which has delayed our opening slightly this year. We're opening on the 10th of June. Um, and um, but nevertheless, it's it's future proof the pool for at least 10, 15 years with uh, significant changes to to the pool basin itself. Um, it's a wonderful facility, attracts people from miles and miles around from all over Scotland, certainly. Um, and uh, it, it's also a great facility for local people. And of course, outdoor swimming is just so popular at the moment that uh, it's a really good time. We had a record year last year and hopefully this year will be as good. Yeah, I was going to say that, Robin. I guess lots of people have been talking about swimming and the, the benefits of cold water swimming and all the rest of it. Are we going to be seeing potentially more of these types of outdoor pools in the future, Robin, from what you can what you can see in terms of popularity? Absolutely. I mean, it's on a real rise. And I think a huge factor, Connie, was COVID. I think when we were all sort of shut down, I think we appreciated the outdoors and getting out there and mother nature and exercise. So I think getting sort of a swim in the wild as it were outside with other people such a fun thing to do and very good for your health so the demand is there and i think people are reacting to that i mean steve just touched on the investment there but even i'm seeing at community level i was in east nuke and i walked past cellar dyke st monans and pittenweem and each of those has community groups getting together trying to encourage the facilities encourage people to get out in the pool so the demand is there and communities and groups are reacting which is great Thanks very much for that, Robin McKelvey, Scottish, War, uh, Scottish travel writer and broadcaster, councillor Francesca Brennan and Steve Harris. I got this text in saying I had a lovely little swim at New Cumnock Pool this week. Uh, outdoor, but magic. Uh, enjoy it. I bet there'll be loads of people doing that today. Enjoy it where you are. Stay safe, of course. Uh, the news at 11 is next. On <laughs>
five past eleven. You're listening to BBC Radio Scotland with me, Connie McLaughlin. How are you doing? Uh, still to come this morning, pet expert Ross Allen is here with our Ask the Vet surgery. So you can get in touch with all your doggy dilemmas and cat queries or whatever they might be. 80295 is the number if you want to text in a question or give me a call. 0885 92 95 00. We're also asking this morning, can you train yourself to be a morning person? We're going to be finding out uh, the latest Scandi lifestyle trend suggests that you probably should do. Uh, Plus, do you like a little bit of chocolate with your cup of tea? We've got uh, some good news for you coming up a little bit later in the show. All the conversations that matter. Mornings on BBC Radio Scotland. We're also playing Name the Place, by the way, and I've got some news on that front. I will give you after this from Amy Winehouse. It's Valerie. We've got a right answer to name the place. It's only taken three clues, by the way, which blows my mind because I have no idea how John and Paisley has guessed it, but he has. Congratulations to John and Paisley. Uh, We will be giving you the right answer at the end of the programme, but keep them coming in. 80295, can you be the second person to get it? Uh, I'm going to give you some wrong answers again, actually. Um, Lum Lash, Mike in Port Glasgow, no. Colin, Neil from uh, Rassi, no. Uh, Colsyth says Stephen, no. Um, Coots in Aberdeenshire no Dougie in Dunfermline uh, Lawrence Kirk Liz in Fife and Liz in Dingwall by the way uh, Kirk Liston or Nick Kirk Newton no um, Johnson John in, in Aberdeen there's there's w- when these come through right these names place, I feel as if it's like a bit of a test for my pronunciation skills so if I failed which I'm sure I probably have on about 100 occasions I'm sorry about that right um, but bear with me I'm doing my best 80295 if you've got um, your clue uh, your question uh, and your answer for for name the place right i will keep them uh, keep them coming in to me and, uh, and i'll give you the answer to that and i'll give you some more 
clues as well in just a couple of minutes time after uh, we do our vet surgery because we've got Ross Allen back with us from Pets and Vets in Glasgow. Morning Ross. Morning Connie. We're going to talk through some of the latest pet stories making the headlines as well and we'll, we'll also take your questions um, so you can get them in right now 08085 92 95 00 or you can send Ross a text on 80295. We have got um, a couple of questions that I want to start with if that's okay Ross. Um, we've got Jean this text and says our dog normally um, on some mornings looks uncomfortable and desperate to go out and eat some grass after half an hour she's sick mostly bile and then completely back to normal any suggestions why she does this and why she needs to do it? Well I think this is something that Connie has been debated for decades and still there's no uh, total clarity in terms of why dogs like or want to do this I mean, there's a lot of dogs do seem to like chewing grass. I think some people maybe think that it's got a digestive benefit in terms of when they, maybe they get up in the morning and they feel they've got a bit of discomfort in their tummy, so they want to chew the grass to kind of help the digestion. There are other people, I mean, there was a client I had in just a, a week or so ago that said their dog didn't normally like chewing grass, but at this time of year, when it's growing quickly, they maybe had a, a larger penchant for um, mm, for chewing the grass, perhaps. That's funny, isn't it? It's sweeter at this time of year. I don't know. I haven't tried it, you know. But there, there probably is, a, you know, some sort of digestive benefit in terms of grass is, you know, pretty much pure fibre, so it probably does help the digestion, and um, that might be one of the reasons that they chew it. And, and maybe another reason is that, you know, dogs are kind of, prone to being sick, more prone to being sick than people are. And so them chewing grass and then being sick and bringing it up might be partly their kind of, you know, um, right back to, you know, dogs developing, you know, thousands, millennia ago was part of their kind of self-help for digestive upset. Probably something like that. Is it a myth that dogs only eat grass to be sick? Um, it might be a myth, it might be the truth. I, I'm not totally sure, Connie, but I think probably some dogs do eat it not just for to be sick, but maybe because they like it too. There might be different people, different opinions, different dogs, you know, but yeah. um, I think it's still a bit unsure. Is it another, and again, I don't necessarily know if you'll know the answer to this, but I suppose it's, it, it's again, maybe an indication to look at diet, maybe. If, if sometimes a dog will eat what it needs to and wherever it finds it to, to try and get the nutrition it needs. Is, is this a time where we really need to be looking at what's in our, our foods and what we're feeding our pets? Well, I think in terms of grass itself, if your dog didn't normally chew it and they started to eat it and they were doing it more, and especially if it accompanied any sort of digestive upset, you know, and we'll know what the symptoms of that could be, mm -hmm. then um, it might be something to, that would warrant investigation. And digestive upsets are definitely one of the most common reasons that dogs and cats, maybe dogs more so than cats, or maybe 50-50, present at vet practices, all right? And so uh, digestive upsets, you know, normally the first thing we would do is have a chat about the diet, whether or not there's been any recent changes in it about the, the type of food that's being fed, the frequency of the food that's being fed and normally there are some quite simple kind of baseline blood samples that can be done to make sure that there's not any obvious digestive problems going on or to start get, to get a handle on what the best plan would be for investigating them a bit further. But definitely, you know, digestive problems are common in pets. And so it's something that if you did notice your pet's digestive habits changing, like their appetite, their thirst, the time they wanted to eat, the, the way they ate or how they picked their food, if they didn't normally uh, used to do that, then um, pr probably get it checked out. And especially if that accompanies an increase in uh, grass eating, it could be relevant for sure. OK, this text in um, is an anonymous text. Uh, thanks, by the way, Jean, for, for sending that message and hopefully that helps. Um, this anonymous text says, we've got a seven-year-old chocolate lab who has fly-catching syndrome. We've seen a neurologist who wants to do an MRI at a spinal tap, which uh, we didn't do. He was on, is it fluoxetine? Yep. Uh, yeah. For the next uh, few years, but it's made no difference. It seems to be worse in the summer as he uh, seeks dark places and it comes and goes. We've uh, had lots of ticks. Uh, he gets lots of ticks, but otherwise he's a healthy dog. Thank you. Well, that's an interesting text. So in terms of fly catching, there are different um, interpretations of what this is. So this is my gut instinct. I could be wrong. Um, but dogs sometimes can show these kind of stereotypic behaviours. So there are you know, people that maybe have similar things where they'll, um, like, Tourette's might be a kind of example, but I'm not a, a psychiatrist or psychologist or whatever, but so these are behaviours that they'll show these kind of repetitive behaviours. So fly catching is, as it sounds, these are dogs that spin round in circles trying to catch things. Okay. Sometimes they'll try to catch their tail or they'll think or people will perceive that's what they're trying to do, but it's a repetitive behaviour. The fluoxetine you, you mentioned, um, you know, that's an antidepressant medication, which is 
uh, one that's licensed for people but has been used for these kind of um, situations in dogs. The theory being that there's maybe a kind of um, anxiety component to the behaviour that they're manifesting and that they're showing. But these are kind of complex things because there's not a, a single obvious cause um, more often than not. But normally the first way of kind of investigating it would be to maybe rule out sort of... Um, nutritional or medical causes or neurological causes and I think for owners being totally honest this is where it can be really difficult you know they could have an MRI done they could have the the spinal cord fluid sampled but in all likelihood that's going to be negative you know it's not likely to show up something pathological that's going to be treated in a specific way quite often it will be or what we perceive to be a psychological um, element to causing the, the symptoms that the, the owners noticed. Uh, OK, thanks so much for uh, whoever texts that in. Keep them coming in, 80295, if you want to ask Ross a question. Um, now, I, th I found this really interesting, talking about, you know, we are, for obvious reasons, discussing a lot about the environment, our carbon footprint, and what we can do to try and, and you know, ensure that we're reducing that. But a new uh, study is saying that having three dogs is as bad for the environment as taking a private jet. Well, I think this is mixing up the press release with the headline, Corey, okay. <laughs> dare I suggest, all right? So this that would is... never happen to tabloids, <laughs> no, surely. No. So th this is the boss of a, a luxury airline, pri private airline company, suggesting that having three dogs is as large, uh, and forgive the pun, uh, paw print as... <laughs> Um, as, as, as taking private jets. The, the truth is that, um, well, I think it's, other it's up to other folks to investigate those statistics and about carbon consumption, carbon footprint. But there is little doubt, and certainly it's something I'm more aware of, that people are thinking about the, the, the environmental impact of pet ownership. And it mainly comes down to a few things. Firstly, about nutrition. A lot of the um, the animals that, that are consumed are consumed as part of food products that are, or pet food products. And there are some companies that are starting to kind of uh, look at ways of developing that. So there's insect-based diets for pets now that are, are nutritionally balanced and have been validated as being good for pets. And people are interested in them in terms of trying to reduce their, their carbon impact. And the other thing is in terms of, as a vet practice, definitely this is something that's on our radar more. So when we are looking at what products we stock in our practice, not only are we thinking about the cost of it, but also about the carbon footprint of those products. So definitely it's something that we're talking about more and more. In what way do you mean where they come from and how they're produced? Because I guess if you're trying to be a, a conscious pet owner, it's a minefield out there. It's really difficult to get the right information. Yes, I think in terms of for pets, like and nutrition is probably the largest element in terms of the carbon footprint of pet ownership. So definitely nutrition. And there are companies that are, as well as marketing specific products, there are companies that are, you know, openly talking more about where their products are sourced from. So that's maybe something for owners to look into if they're interested in this. Um, in terms of for us as a company, this is about where our products are sourced from and about their the number of miles travelled and about the scope for recycling them or not. So all those things come into play. Uh, OK, the, the next story I wanted to talk to you about was um, marriage and kids. No, apparently not. Um, Gen Z want fur babies. <laughs> That's uh, apparently we're getting, ki uh, getting kids, getting dogs and cats and pets younger than we've ever done before, which I guess is, is tricky because it's making things quite unaffordable in terms of care as, as these people get older. Yeah, well, the suggestion in this article was that maybe in the past folk, um, you know, settled down, got married, became parents in their 20s and then got a pet, you know, and I, I don't know if I totally agree that that's the way things used to be. You know, I don't think this is totally new that, um, you know, young couples may get pets before, um, before moving in together or getting their first flat or whatever, but... It is one of these things, like with the you know the cost of house prices, with um, rental going up, and just over you know the whole cost of living. That is definitely a big challenge for for many people. Perhaps people are viewing that pets are a kind of easier thing to get to demonstrate commitment to each other. I don't know. It's a, it's a, it's a bit woolly, and I think you know, dangerous ground to go into, Kelly. It, does that come back to again? I know we've we've touched on this probably before, but this whole. <laughs> consideration about animals and, 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 and buying pets and, 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 you know, bringing pets into your family and just ensuring, and, and or how do you ensure that you can cost that correctly so that you can give these animals the, the right care that they need? It's not just necessarily about 
time and if you're, well, you know, how you work and whatever else, they've actually been able to afford to not just, I guess, their food, but also vet, bill, uh, vet bills if they, they might come up. It's definitely something to have that chat, you know, if, I mean, I'm not giving relationship advice, Connie, but maybe, you know. That could be a new surgery we could well, do. Well, if you're at that point as a couple where you're thinking about commitment and what that means, all right? I mean, the, the, the line in the story was about that um, pets are relatively cheap compared to the increasingly unaffordable traditional milestones. But I think um, relatively cheap, but I think you might be able to get a pet and it doesn't cost you a lot of money and there's charities that are seeking to rehome them. But at the same time, there is that commitment in terms of the food the nutrition, there's the vet bills, there's the vaccination preventative health costs as well as cost of treatment as it were. And, you know, not everybody will do like, you know, three years of cash flow forecasting on the impact on your family finances. But at the same time, thinking, you know, that's not going to be like a five or a week here or there. That's going to be an ongoing commitment. So I think maybe trying to think about the numbers, also thinking about, you know, insurance. Is that something that you want, that you can afford, the types of insurance? There's pros and cons to that, about level of cover, about the excesses on the policy. There's all those things to take into account. But um, pet ownership shouldn't be a kind of you know instinctive thing it should be something that is considered and thought about and discussed as a couple before you commit to it for sure okay stay where you are we've got more questions for ross coming up um 80295 if there's anything that you want to ask uh, ross maybe it's about the hot weather maybe it's about i don't know something that you think oh, i don't really want to bother uh, you know getting an appointment for but it's something that's been on your mind this is your opportunity to do that 80295 to text or you can give them a call 08085 9295 00 uh, after me uh, at midday it's lunchtime live uh, Hayley miller will be here what's coming up on the program Hayley? hi there connie well we're going to be uh, getting the latest on the uh, waiting times um, figures that have just come out this morning. The government has missed targets uh, to eliminate waiting times for people waiting more than a year to see specialist doctors. Also uh, missing um, the uh, two-year waiting times as well for people for routine surgery. So we'll be looking at that and why we don't seem to be making any progress on those waiting times. Uh, we'll also hear about a woman who was assaulted by her police officer partner who wants the time limit in which she can claim compensation scrapped for domestic abuse survivors because she said many survivors aren't ready to come to terms with things and um, and take a case really within a three year time period. So we'll hear about her own experience. Uh, we'll talk uh, fostering as well because uh, former First Minister Nicola Sturgeon has said that she's thinking long and hard about becoming a foster mom, reiterating a sort of revelation she made a few years ago that uh, she and her husband were considering fostering once she left office. So we'll see. Uh, we'll talk about look at look at just how many foster uh, homes are families are needed uh, for children in uh, the care system. And we will also be hearing about the uh, mystery case of uh, the grand nephew of Bram Stoker, who of course uh, wrote Dracula. Oh, yeah. Uh, his... Um, uh, he, his great nephew, it is. He's uh, come, trying to locate a woman, a Scottish woman, who may have been the inspiration for um, the very famous Gothic novel. So more on that uh, with Graeme Stewart and myself from Twelve. A female Dracula. And bits... Well, yes, she she was very into uh, all sorts of uh, vampire myths and and things. Ooh. And apparently, he met her, and uh, she may have inspired uh, many of the details in Dracula. Very, very interesting. Right, that's after 12 o'clock lunchtime live um, with Hayley and Graham. Thanks very much for that, Hayley. 11.24, Ross Allen is still with us. We are talking about all things pets. Um, our resident vet is Ross Allen. Uh, I wanted to ask you about... Um, Sharing your garden, right? Because I, I'll tell you, uh, this is an interesting story, and I have I have um, skin in the game, so to speak, right? Because we we live in a we live in a in a flat, right? And we have, um, as you know, we've got our dog Luna. She absolutely um, hates her her, her, her neighbours, which are four cats. That I swear to God, feel as if they they taunt her from the window. <laughs> <laughs> They'll come up and sit in the window and just like look in and she'll go mental. Um, but some people, this can be a bit of a challenge for maybe, especially this time of the year, for their gardens and to have these lovely neighbours not wean on their gardens and then their flowers. How do you stop doing that but making sure that you are, you know, taking care that, that no animals are injured in this process? Well, especially at this time of year, there are lots of people across the whole of Scotland who love their gardens, don't they, Connie? 
Yes, they and do. If, you know, the warm weather, they're wanting to put in those bedding plants, the seeds are going in the ground, the garden's coming to life, but unfortunately, the neighbour's cats can be um, prone to coming into the garden. And, you know, cats like digging holes. It's what they normally do when they go to the toilet or whatnot. And quite often, they'll choose to go into the, the bedded plant areas, which doesn't go down well. So... There's, there's lots of different suggestions or ideas in terms of what folk can do to deter cats from going onto the bedded areas, you know. Um, but if you are going to do it, what's most important is you're not going to hurt the cat. I mean, there is a welfare thing. You definitely shouldn't be doing that. But there probably are some kind of tricks that you can try. So maybe the first thing is that if, it, if there's scope to do it, if, if the plants are just coming through and they're going to cover that area, then maybe putting down chicken wire, not to catch the cat and not to um, you know, hurt it in any way, but just to, the cats don't like the texture of walking over chicken wire if that's over your bedded areas. So maybe that's an option. Other things that people have tried, and I have seen in some of my friends' and family's neighbours' gardens, is um, putting in things like plastic forks, right? Now, I did originally, when I saw them, think they might be plants, but no, they were forks that were stuck in the ground and shiny and silver, and the, the cats may not like that. Um, so wait a minute, wait a minute. What, yeah. So what, what kind of forks? Plastic forks. Like, so, it was so like takeaway food forks, as right. it were, that were stuck in the ground with not the forked end, the other end. Right. And the idea is that cats might not like them. I've no... You don't know why? I, well, I don't know, but they seem to <laughs> reside in that garden all year oh. round, but maybe forks. OK. Um, other thing is that, you know, this is obviously what people have tried. There's little science behind this, right? So the, the dangling DVDs, you know, so... Those, uh, the, the light shining off the DVD surface, maybe dangled from like nylon fishing line or whatever. Might, so you, you've might, get, yeah, you, well, the, cat, the cats are then deterred, but you get the magpies then flying in. <laughs> maybe, you know, it's things swooping around and jumping into these gardens, but avoiding the plants. So, and another thing, maybe if you know, if you're more looking for the organic approach or whatever, is to go for like citrus fruits. Some people think that if you put down, um, you know, orange peel, lemon peel, that might dissuade cats from going in that area. And the other thing, and there is a problem with uh, accessing this, but large cat poo. I have no idea where you'd get this in, in Scotland or how easy it would be to source, but if you can get lion poo or tiger poo, supposedly that will put cats coming into your garden. Oh, as in big cats, as in big cats. Really big cats. Not just a, not just a large cat that Good. happens to be stro strolling about your street. Yeah, no, okay. proper, big proper big cats. Okay, right, interesting. Um, if you're at home and maybe, I don't know, you've tried something, 80295, if there's something that maybe Ross is saying that we've not mentioned, you can you can share your wisdom with us. Um, just a final one on that, actually, just before you go. Um, is there ever a way that you can introduce, I'm thinking about the, the cats I was talking about in my street, that you can introduce, you know, dogs and cats together so that they can live more harmoniously together without it ending in a scrap? I think if they're in the same street, you know, not in the same house, well, it's probably they're probably going to know where their zones are and what's their territory. And cats normally aren't going to want to get in a fight unless they're feeling pinned down or constrained or things like that. If they're part of the same family, it's good to kind of maybe get them used to each other initially through in the house, maybe through a glass door or um, a, a garden gate so they get to know each other. But normally they will settle in pretty well. But I think in a neighbourhood... Um, the dogs and the cats will normally get on all right or the cats will still stay well out of the way of the dogs and be unlikely to incite any aggression. That's not really their style. No, no, in my street, they go her. They honestly... And, do you know, I think it's because they know she's on the lead as well, so they, they know that she can't do anything. So she's going ballistic and they're just strolling by, just, like, strolling quite nonchalantly, which, which I love. I love their um, just brazenness of what they do. Oh, they're, they're pretty cool, our cats, aren't they? Yeah. yeah, indeed. Right, well, listen, if you've got any tips on that as well, 80295, this is for my own personal uh, interest. Uh, right, listen, Ross, always good to speak to you. Um, we will chat to you again soon. Enjoy the sunshine. Thanks, Connie. That was uh, Ross Allen from Pets and Vets in Glasgow. Thank you so much to everyone who got in touch with us. It is just coming up to half past 11. Artificial intelligence, it's kind of in everyone's consciousness now. Do you see it as an opportunity or a challenge? Of course, it's both. Getting to the heart of the stories, making the news. What do I make of the idea of a bus that drives itself? Every photograph that is brought to me, how on earth am I going to be able to tell whether it's genuine or manipulated? Exploring the world that's changing around us. We tasked an artificial intelligence programme to produce a poem. So let the music play on and on, from Glasgow's streets to Orkney's dawn, Radio Scotland. Scotland's voice will ring true, a steadfast friend to see you through. I think I should just go. Listen across the day on BBC Sounds. It all begins when you play BBC Radio Scotland. 
You're listening to Mornings with Connie McLaughlin. I'm here with you until 12. Still to come, we often hear about how successful people are when they get up like super early, they get stuff done, uh, while the rest of us are still in our beds having a little snooze. But can you train yourself to become a morning person? We're going to find out shortly. Plus, uh, are you getting you enough flavonoids in your system? Do you even know what they are? Well, me neither. But apparently they can help improve your memory. Keep listening to find out. By the way, it's just a little hint for you. It might be chocolate and uh, and, and dark tea. Um, so that's good news. Um, keep your thoughts coming in about that. And name the place as well. I'm going to give you a clue next. Get in touch with BBC Radio Scotland. You can call our free phone number on 08085 929500. Text 80295. Standard message rates apply. This is BBC Radio Scotland. We've already had one right answer, but don't let that deter you. Let's keep playing along. I'm going to give you clue four. Clue one, today's place name refers to a little known saint. Clue two, it also contains a little known word for a church. Clue three, the only known church dedicated to the same saint was at Concarden and Menteith in Stirling. And clue four, it shares a component with Balquidu. It shares a component with Bal Quidu. Does that make any sense to you? Uh, you know how to get in touch. 80295. Let's get some more music now. This is Tom Walker. Just you and I. It's 11.34 here in BBC Radio Scotland. It's Connie with you until midday today. Now, are you an early bird or are you more 
a night owl, right? We often hear about how successful people get up super early and get stuff done while the rest of us might be still snoozing in our beds. Um, but now there's a new Swedish trend. You know, the Scandinavians love a lovely uh, sort of trend to make us feel good. Uh, Gotika, I think that's how you pronounce it. That's uh, the new and latest one. It's providing to be popular online. It promises to put you in a better mood and make you more productive first thing in the morning. But is it too good to be true? Can you really train yourself to be more of a morning? person. Here to discuss this more with me is Fat Abristofica, presenter and comedian. Morning, Fat. Good morning, Connie. Good to hear from you. Uh, we've also got uh, Laura van der Kam, who's author uh, of What the Most Successful People Do Before Breakfast, which I'm interested to hear more about. Morning, Laura. Good morning. And we've got Dr Neil Stanley, who's an independent sleep expert. Morning, Neil. Good morning. Right, Fat, let me start with you because you've just got a new job. You're going to need to get up early. How's it going? Oh no! Well, right, listen. In fact, we've, we've, in fact, we've got an issue with your line, right? So we're going to get that sorted first and foremost, and we'll come back and speak to you in just a second. Um, but Laura, you you've written about this. You know about this. Are early risers more successful? Not so much that early risers are successful, so much that the world kind of rewards that this is time you can do things um, before the rest of the world wants a piece of you. So for many busy people, if you are going to exercise, if you are going to do a long term project, if you have some sort of spiritual discipline you want to pursue, mornings tend to be the time to do it. You can get up. You can get it done, score a win earlier in the day, and then the day goes as it is. But at least you've had that. And you, uh, you, you put your money where your mouth is because it's half past six, is it, where you are right now? <laughs> well, I'm in the United States, so yes, it is It is morning. I'm not naturally a morning person. Um, however, I, I do find that it is a good time to get up and get things done. However, to make that happen, you really have to go to bed on time the night before. So whether you are, there are some people who are confirmed larks, there are some people who are confirmed night owls. Most of us are more in the middle, but if we do want to seize those early morning hours to, I guess, go outside as the Swedes like to do or do whatever else it is you want to do, um, the most important thing is getting to bed on time. And if you can master that, then you can turn yourself into at least more of a morning person. Uh, Dr. Neil, is there such a thing as a night person or a morning person? Is this just something that we've created in our society? No, there is, there is such a thing, and it is genetically determined. So, um, you know, about 25, 30% are early morning people, about 20, 25% are strong evening people. And as I said, most people don't have a strong preference. But because it's genetic, it means you can't train yourself to be one or the other. If you're a night person, you can, of course, get up at whatever time you like, but you are not going to be functioning optimally. So larks who are strong morning people will you know, be able to get up and seize the day. But if you're a strong morning person, it's going to cause you problems to do so. And, and the idea that successful people get up early in the morning is just self and nonsense. <laughs> it's, 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 it's just silly beyond belief. This goes back to early morning where you got up to praise God because God rewarded you for praising. And now it's been turned into this idea that you'll be more successful if you exercise at five o'clock, which is not a time to exercise from any physiological uh, point of view at all. So it's just nonsense spread around by, by the internet, which uh, you shouldn't be relied upon for information. Laura? Um, so that's a, one way to put it. I, I, I totally agree that there are people who are confirmed night owls. The issue, again, is that you have to deal with society being like that. So if you can set up your life as a night owl <clears throat> to support your success, that is wonderful. Um, and, you know, on many people, though, who are night owls still have to deal with the fact that they have to get up in the morning. But again, most people are in the middle. And you don't have to wake up, you know, at 5 a.m. if you don't want to. But let's say you have to be at work at 9 o'clock. If you are more in the middle and you decide to get up at, say, you know, 6.30, 7 and do something that matters to you, this is time you can kind of open up in your day. And the issue is that most people 
you know, if they stay up, they, they stay up late and then aren't able to function in the morning, regardless of where they are on the spectrum. But if you, you know, look at what people are often doing at night before they go to bed, not all people are these wonderful, you know, night owls who are writing great novels or doing amazing things late at night. A lot of people just sort of scrolling around on the internet, which we just disparaged. So if that's the case, you can go to bed early, wake up early, turn unproductive evening hours into morning hours that you can do something that matters to you. Right. Uh, Fat Brasovka is back with us. Fat, um, you, I was just saying that you've, you've got a new job. Um, it means you need to get up early. Dr. Neil was just saying there that, that he doesn't necessarily think that there's, there's massive benefits uh, if you're getting up early, if you're not a morning person. Um, and Laura was saying something similar. Are, are you? How have you found it? Wow. Well, I have to say, uh, Night Owl is written into my DNA. It screams <laughs> Night Owl. So the oh dear. fact that I'm here talking to morning person is absolutely bizarre to, to me, Connie, honestly. Uh, I'm not going to lie, though. I thought it would be much harder. I thought it was going to be a, a, a really, really difficult slog in the mornings getting up. I found it a couple of weeks in, suddenly, you know, with a bit of routine, it's not that difficult. One thing that isn't great is it's not ideal for your social life. You have to go to bed at nine o'clock. I know. What what time are you up? It ha- oh no, we missed you there. Fat. What, what time did you say we missed you? Your line dropped again. <laughs> Half past four in the morning. Half past four. Half past four. Listen, do you find... So I, I do a lot of breakfast radio as well. Normally I'm up at half three, right? And, and I, I find myself doing that thing where I'm like then beginning to obsess about counting the hours sleep that I've got. <laughs> <laughs> Are you there yet? Yeah, absolutely. I, I, you know, I, I now really sleep. All people ask me about is sleep. All yeah. I ever have to say is something to do with sleep. <laughs> so I feel like I've become some sort of sleep uh, expert. Uh, I, I don't know if you... Oh, no, Fat's like, like, fat's like, like yeah, Fat, your line keeps dropping out. Um, I, I think we've got the gist of what you're saying there, that, that you can, in some ways, make it a bit easier because he's getting into a bit of routine with it. Um, Neil, w- with that in mind, and, and from what both you and Laura are saying, is, is it a case that you're more, you need to be more in tune with what you need and what is personal to you to make sure that you're functioning at an optimal level? Is that what you're saying? Okay. Absolutely. And and with regards to going to bed early, you can't go to bed early uh, because we all have a sleep gate, uh, which would be the optimal time for us to go to sleep. So going to bed early just means you're going to lie awake until your sleep gate means you go to sleep. So, how do we know um, then? How do we know what, what, what's right for us? So you're talking about sleep gate. What, what's, how do we know when's the right time? When you feel sleep, go to bed when you feel sleepy. Get up when you've had enough sleep. And if you feel awake, alert, focused during the day, you've had enough sleep whatever time but we are you know these things are controlled by a clock if you mess around with the clock things go wrong and everything in our body is run on a 24-hour clock so getting up stupidly early or going to bed early is just messing with the routine and to try and do that for some benefit that you believe that you're going to be more successful I mean there's books called the morning millionaires and that sort of thing is just is just silly beyond belief but uh, you know no, don't ever let science get in the way of a good idea. <laughs> well, the thing is, Laura, is there? It's tricky, isn't it? Because as you were saying, it, it, it's ideally it would be great if we went to bed when we were sleepy, right? But there's the parts of that we could be overstimulated, so we don't know if we're too sleepy because we're too busy watching something on on uh, on the TV or or you know stuck to our phones, so we don't really know properly when we're sleepy. And I guess the other part of that is. We've most of us have something that we need to get up for. So you know, it's a case of is it is it trying to find the right job then that means that you can just get up whenever you don't feel tired anymore. Well, that would be wonderful if you got one, or if you have no. I mean, I guess many of us have young children who are also up very early in the morning. I'm not sure what we're supposed to do with them um, in this world where we just wake up where we uh, when we feel like it and go to bed when we feel like it too. Um, but you know, again, I, I think. Uh, it would be wonderful if people could could do that. But again, many people in this modern world aren't necessarily aware of when their sleep window would be because of the amount of sort of electronic things that are going on. We're not all, you know, living around a, a campfire where we go to bed, you know, early because the, the, the night is over, uh, it's dark. Um, so because of that, I think it's a lot harder for people to determine. I've certainly seen a great many people who believe they are not morning people because they are tired in the morning, but once they decide to start going to bed a little bit earlier and not pushing through that sense of sleepiness because, you know, there's something else to read on the internet, 
um, they've, they've been able to, to get up more effectively and sort of have a better, more controlled sense of sleep. And when you wake up well rested, um, feeling good, and it's earlier than you absolutely have to be up last minute for work, then there is time there that you can often use for things that are personally important to you. If people do wish to exercise, um, you know, busy people, this is often a time they can have to do it. Um, if they want to um, you know, do any sort of creative work, again, this is a time you can have to do it. So for many people, this winds up working out really well. Uh, this is really interesting. It's got me, um, it makes me feel a bit better because I do feel a little bit obsessed with sleep right now. So it's it's good to hear that other people like Fat, we were hearing there, <laughs> is doing the same. Laura, it was lovely to hear from you. Thank you so much for, for your time and your, um, your insight this morning. That was Laura Vanderkamp, author of What the Most Successful People Do Before Breakfast, and Dr Neil Stanley. Thanks for that, Neil, um, who's an independent sleep expert as well. What they're saying is just trying to find what works for you. There's not necessarily a specific point that's like the optimal time, which I find really interesting as well. Right, we're going to be speaking about how to boost your memory through eating chocolate. Do not miss that uh, coming up shortly. It kind of feels like the next chapter is opening up. The BBC Radio Scotland Young Traditional Musician for 2023 is... Amy Lawrenson! Could you be the next winner of this life-changing award? The search for BBC Radio Scotland's Young Traditional Musician 2024 is on. Being part of it was such a great experience. Just spending time with such amazing musicians. Singers and instrumentalists aged between 16 and 27 have until midnight on Sunday the 25th of June 2023 to apply. For more information, terms, privacy notice and to enter, Head to bbc.co.uk slash youngtrad. Catch up on The Conversation. Listen via the BBC Sounds app. Mornings on BBC Radio Scotland. Right, clue five and six on the way for Name the Place after a little bit of Aretha. This is Say a Little Prayer.
Aretha Franklin, I say a little prayer. It's uh, 10 minutes to midday today. Um, right, we've had loads of people getting in touch for Name the Place. Um, here's a couple of wrong answers uh, if you've not heard them already. Kilside says Stephen. No, is it Killin? says Neil. No, Lam Lash says Mike in Port Glasgow. Uh, Whitthorn, Martin. Um, no, it's not either. Uh, Kirk Listener, Kirk Newton. No, it's not. Jude, thanks so for getting in touch. Uh, that's Jude and Bathgate. Um, 80295. You've still got 10 minutes to go before we get the big reveal. Um, I'm going to give you clue five and six. Right, clue number five. The next clue can be found in the cry of the cuckoo and the roar of the bull. The cry of the cuckoo and the roar of the bull. That's where the next clue can be found. That's clue number five. Clue number six is just simply well, well, well. That's an easy one. Clue number six. Well, it might be. might not be. Well, well, well. That's clue number six. Does that make it any easier? Where is the place name in Scotland that we're trying to find with those clues? 80295. Um, we have got... Loads coming up um, tomorrow as well. I'm back with you for another pack show from the phone and, of course, from nine o'clock. And you might have seen in the news that the Met Police Force in London will soon refuse to attend mental health emergencies. Did you see this? I think it's coming in from September. We'll be getting the picture about the resources that police spend on those calls here in Scotland and why the chair of the Scottish Police Federation believes it's harming core police services. But I suppose the flip side of that is then who takes over those services so that people are not left vulnerable. We'll talk more about that tomorrow. Court of Karen, of course, on a Wednesday this week. Uh, the question is, where are you um, on the jury of the everyday problem? Our defendant is furious that a stranger um, is using their wheelie bin for their dog mess. But are they overreacting? <laughs> this is going to be a divisive one. I sense that Court of Karen is back tomorrow and much, much more from nine o'clock. Um, but before that, right, you might be uh, thinking to yourself, has my memory as good as it used to be? Right, well, you might need some flavonoids in your life. They're powerful components that can be found in dark chocolate, tea, apples and berries. And the reason we're talking about them is because new research suggests that increasing the amount of them in your diet can improve your memory, apparently. Uh, here to tell us more is Jane Tobias, who's a doctor of nutrition. Morning, Jane. Morning, Connie. How are you doing? I'm good, thanks. I'm good. Uh, we've also got Dominic O'Brien, who's an eight-time world memory champion and three times world senior memory champion. Morning, Dominic. Good morning. Wow. Right. OK. Um, Dominic, are you uh, loading up on uh, things like uh, black tea, dark chocolate, apples, berries? Well, uh, yeah, I have a bit of milk in my tea, but I cheat a bit there. But, um, but there's always some information coming out about things like chocolate and multivitamins. But this has been uh, an inter interesting research. Um, it's supposed to lower blood pressure and increase blood flow to the heart and the brain. So I might try a bit of dark chocolate. <laughs> oh, I think that's only fair. I think that's only fair. Right, Jane, <laughs> what exactly is a flavanol then? Right, a flavanol is a compound that's found naturally in certain foods. We used to call them superfoods. And they tend to be very much the dark colours that you see, like purples and that sort of colour that you see in lots of fruits and berries. And they are a compound that the body naturally uh, will be able to um, break it down and use within it. And particularly if we've got really good gut health, the good bacteria in our system will help us even more and produce these flavonols and flavonoids, which will help support all the different functions in our body, including improving blood flow, as Dominic mentioned, and also improving cognition, which is what all this is about. Right, so you were saying darker types of foods. So we, we heard berries, right, yes. tea, chocolate, but then what, what other things What other uh, things could we be eating and, and, get, and how much of them do we need to actually consume for it to make a difference? Yeah, I mean, the thing is that if you're having one of these rainbow diets, this is one of the things I always tell people to do, is have a rainbow of foods. And I, I don't mean having these seats on all different colours. I mean like having berries in your diet, raspberries, strawberries, blueberries, blackberries, these, all these colours, and apple as well is very good, green tea particularly, and cocoa berries, which is where we get um, chocolate from, these are all good sources. So any of a kind of dark colour, these contain the flavonols particularly. Um, I mean, a lot, a lot of them are in others, but they're most rich in these darker coloured fruits and, and vegetables to a certain extent. Dominic, is nutrition part of the way that you help yourself when it comes to using your memory? Yeah, nutrition does play a part. I mean, I, I don't train as hard as I used to. So I, I don't compete that much these days. But when I did, uh, I'd make sure I got a good night's sleep. That's very important. And a balanced mm -hmm. diet. Um, fortunately, my wife's a very good cook. So um, having plenty of fish as well is good for the brain, I believe. So, so three or four times a week, have a bit of fish as well. Um, 
Uh, occasionally, I'll take vitamin B. I think vitamin B6 and B12 helps as well, helps with cognition, um, and boosts the energy levels as well for the brain, because it's quite a grueling um, competition. It's three days. You've got 10 events, and you've got to memorize thousands of numbers, binary digits, names and faces, words, play, uh, 30 packs of playing cards in an hour you've got to memorize. So a, a lot of energy is being used up. <laughs> I can imagine. So you, uh, that that is amazing. Do you think that anyone? I mean, and that that's the extreme version. Not mm. everyone's going to be able to do that. I would imagine. But do you think that, that we can all train our memory to be a little bit better? And if so, how do we well, do it? Yeah. Um, well, actually, the answer is um, every anybody can do it to a degree, but you've got to want to do it. Not uh, not everybody wants to train six to ten hours a day, which is what the Chinese and Mongolians are doing at the moment. As we speak, they're in training for the next World Memory Championships. But yeah, a little uh, little tricks. It's all about coding information. So numbers don't mean anything to us; they're unintelligible. But if you use a shape, for example, you know, like a one could look like a pencil, two look like a swan three handcuffs, four sailboat, eight looks like a snowman. Once you've got a system going and you've converted the information into pictures, then you need to put them somewhere. So I use journeys. I use places. You've probably heard of memory palaces as favoured by Sherlock Holmes. So I would, to memorise like a 30-digit number, I'd imagine, for example, a snowman standing at my front door, number eight. And as I go inside, it's a bit dark, so I light a candle. That's one. Go into the dining room, there's a balloon and a string, which looks like the number nine, someone's birthday. And at the sink in the kitchen, there's an elephant drinking some water through its trunk. So what's the number? <laughs> the front door, can you remember the snowman? Mm -hmm. Eight. And in the landing, it was a bit dark. So the candle, number one. Mm -hmm. Number one, yeah. And in the dining room. Number nine with the balloon. Yep. Got nine as well. Sink. And at the sink. What? What is the elephant one? Yeah, you don't know. Oh, it's a six. It's a oh, six. Oh, a yeah. six. Right. I wasn't a sure what way the like elephant elephant. was going, what, what the elephant was doing with the trunk. That's what I needed to be clear of. <laughs> yeah, well, you've, got to know, you've got to know what your symbols are. <laughs> so yeah, that's quite helpful. Um, but we use more sophisticated uh, systems than that. I, I, I look at four digits and I see a, an image straight away. So I have pairs of numbers from 00 to 99. For example, Barack Obama is the number 20. Second letter of the alphabet is B, and O looks like a zero. 53 is Eric Clapton. Fifth letter of the alphabet is E, and the third is C. Yeah, that, that's... So I would imagine Barack Obama playing the guitar, 2053, at my front door. If it's the other way round, 5320, I'd imagine Eric Clapton waving the US flag, for example. It's it's, okay. ama it's amazing just mm. the, the different ways that that we can use to to improve things. I'm going I'm going to have to research this a little bit more because my memory I feel as if it's absolutely rubbish right now. But this has been so uh, so interesting. Thank you so much to both of you, uh, Jane uh, Tobias, doctor of nutrition. There talking about the importance of having the rainbow diet, darker foods, and everything else if we want to improve our our, our memory. And Dominic, um, great to speak to you as well, Dominic O'Brien. There, eight times world memory champion and three times world senior memory champion. I was really glad that I was listening to what he was saying there because that could have been that could have been disastrous if I wasn't. Right, speaking of someone, um, well, people actually who have been listening intently and have a good memory for place names, uh, you certainly need that uh, if you're playing Name the Place. And John and Paisley uh, has been doing that this morning because he was the first one to give a correct answer. Morning, Carol Huff. Good morning, Cody. Um, good to speak to you, Professor of Onomastics, of course, at Glasgow University, who is the brains behind our Name the Place quiz. And we got a right answer at 11 o'clock this morning. Which was brilliant. Um, right, that, um, that drum roll means that it's up to you to tell us where we were today, Carol. We were in Bon Hill in Western Bartonshire. Right, how did we get there? Well, it refers to a little-known saint. Bonhill means the Church of St. Lolan, from Gallic Bowes, which means both church and hut, and the name of an obscure saint, Lolan. It's changed into hill by a process known as folk etymology, where an unfamiliar word or name is confused with a recognisable word that actually has no connection with it. Uh, so clue two also contains a little-known word for a church. That's Gallic Bowes, meaning church, and the same word can also mean a hut. 
So Clue 3, the only known church dedicated to the same saint was at Kincardine in Menteith. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's St Lowland's Church and Burial Ground, now a Category B listed building. OK, Clue 3. Uh, clue 4, shares a component okay. with mm-hmm. Barquidder. So Barquidder means the hut of Quidder. That's from Gallic bowls in its alternative meaning, hut. Mm-hmm. Uh, clue 5 can be found in the cry of the cuckoo and the roar of the bull. OK, that's Clue... That's song, the braise of Bonnall. OK, uh, Clue 6. Those words are in the chorus. Well, well, well. Um, according to the Bonhill Church website, Bonhill has been served by many interesting clergy, and one of them had the unusual practice okay. of baptising children at a well that outside is, a nearby hostelry. That is how we got to Bonhill this morning. Carol, thank you very much for that. Uh, enjoyed your company today. Thanks to everyone who got in touch with us. It's time for Lunchtime Live. I'm back tomorrow. Thanks, Connie.